Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that very warm welcome, Steve. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I like the title, the concept of this conference very much. Uh, this is what we all got to think about. The food we eat really matters. It matters in so many ways. Um, as Steve said, uh, he said 60 years. It's actually been 65 years now <laughs> since I started my uh, graduate research. And uh, it's been a long number of years, and I've had a variety of experiences, and so uh, the new book that I'm now just finishing with, uh, working with my grandson actually, uh, is, is an attempt to summarize some of the highlights that affected my thinking. Because my thinking in the very beginning, 65 years ago, was very different, as I'll show in a moment, and as many of you may know. And so it's been a challenge. It's been a challenge at times. It's also been extraordinarily rewarding, meeting so many good people. Uh, in this whole movement. And so I want to share with you uh, just some highlights, essentially, of some of the things I learned and what I think it meant as I look back. You know, it's always nice to have some hindsight, as all of you know. And so as I look back, I can see, I think, the main things that affected my thinking and, then, and also the kind of things that I think can be actually very rewarding. Um, as Steve said, my discipline, my formal discipline, is nutritional science. And that's a topic that has not been appreciated, as all of you know. It's at the fundamental basis, in fact, for the so-called whole food plant-based diet. And it's that science, it's the way we do the science that really matters. And I want to share with you, uh, in a sense, uh, some of the things we did along the way. And I think of science as... You know, you do a whole lot of different kinds of experiments, and you have this experience and that experience. But at the end of the day, you kind of have to sit back and look at all those details and see what it means in the whole. And so my title, as you can see, is Nutritional Science. It's not quite what I just said it is. It's a centuries-old disaster. I really mean that because I've just finished another book, retracing some of the, th the things that we think about nutrition for the last century, at least, and actually goes back to the late 1700s. There was a time when uh, I was at Oxford University for a year and getting a lot of pushback and was curious about, you know, what, what's, what's going on here? What is causing the, the hostility? What is causing the emotion of this, of this topic? So I want to share with you then just kind of a summary of some of these things that I'm, I'm, this is, in a sense, this is the first of a series of lectures, but I try to see what I can get under one roof, you know, as far as that 65 years of a concern. So I'm gonna start out and share with you one of the benchmarks that I had in my career. Um, this is back in 1982, 1980 to 82. At that time, I had already been in research, doing studies, publishing things, and that sort of thing for about, uh, tw actually more than 20 years. So I had the pleasure of being uh, invited to serve on a panel of the, di of the National Academy of Science on diet, nutrition, and cancer. And this, incidentally, was a first attempt by an official agency, if you will, to actually deal with the subject of the relationship of diet and nutrition with cancer. I was on the panel, there were 13 of us at the time, this is the first of its kind. Um, and so it was a lot of fun. I, I had a lot of fun in that, in that particular sense, so debating issues and so forth and so on. Um, and so this, this report eventually turned out to be the most sought after report in the history of the National Academy. Such was the interest of this topic for the public. To talk about something like cancer and diet and in, what you eat might make a difference and that sort of thing, we made some really modest recommendations. I mean, it was, at the time, it was kind of new. You had to be kind of careful. You can't go too far out of line with what the facts are. And so we did something to advocate vegetables, fruits, and grains. What do you do? I mean, you know, that's, that's pretty simple. But you can't believe how much... Uh, Commotion that caused, quite frankly, at the time. We said, 
also amongst the general information something specific. We were the first ones to say to reduce total fat, dietary fat, from the average of somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 percent or so, down to 30 percent. When we were deliberating on the question of how much the fat should be reduced in the diet, there were some of us pointing to the fact that we had some information that should be lower than 30 percent. But and at the end of the day, we were advised by one of the members of our committee, if you go below 30 percent, that's going to mean cutting into the consumption of animal foods and animal protein in particular. But in any case, uh, I, it was going to kind of tip off. I mean, I was already aware at that time that to talk about animal protein as a nutrient was a little touchy, a little sensitive to say the least. It still is, as many of you know. So we stopped at 30%, and so the origin of that 30% figure was nothing more than a mathematical, if you will, or a cultural kind of thing. Okay, we can go to the 30%. We couldn't say 29% because that might mean cutting into animal food. So I, I want to make that point. We'll come back to it in a moment. That affected me a great deal because I, at that point, the research that I was doing was, in fact, based, as you'll hear in a moment, on the role of protein, particularly animal protein, in, in uh, disease formation. Along the way in the book, too, we talked about individual nutrients and what we thought they were and so forth and so on, what they could do. But we summarized in the executive summary something that was actually quite highlighted at the time. We were not advocating the use of nutrients as single chemicals. We were talking about the whole food. And so we did not, in fact, support the idea and called attention to the readers of the book that we were not, in fact, talking about advocating nutrient supplements. Mind you, this is 1982. What, how many long was That's 40 years ago. Uh, but in any case, and I became quite involved in uh, discussions involving whether or not nutrient supplements could do the same thing as food. But in any case, I uh, then we, we had chapters in there on the different nutrients, like fat and sugar and, or carbohydrate, if you will, and vitamins and minerals, so forth and so on. But the committee uh, did not want to have a chapter on protein. Well, that's why I was there, in a sense, because that was my work. So I, I persuaded the committee, okay, let me write that. We should have a chapter on protein. And finally, they kind of conceded, okay, you write the chapter. You write the draft. So I wrote the draft and got a little bit of attention drawn to the question of protein. I should say a lot of attention, uh, because I wrote the chapter uh, with a colleague of mine, and there it was, stuck in the book. But in, in, in due course, uh, it was a sensitive nerve. Just the question talking about protein was a sensitive nerve. So as a result of that, and then I, unfortunately, in many ways, I kind of became the face of that you know, committee, in part, because I was only one of two of the 13 of us, only one of two who actually had been involved in the experimental research, in, in a sense. And mine was focused on protein. So I was also asked at the time to present to congressional committees and be on PBS with McNair Lair and magazines and stuff like that. And because, it, you know, this, this topic that I was concerned about, protein, it was a sensitive topic, usually in the negative, I, I should say. I'm just going to just uh, itemize for you. I'll come back to this. I don't want to dwell on this. But as a result of being on that panel, and my professional society, actually, at the time, uh, there was an attempt by the two leading authorities in that whole federation of medical societies, about 85,000, I think, membership at that time. But in any case, they proposed that I get expelled from my society. This is at the time that I had just already been nominated by the society, their choice to be the president of the society. <laughs> kind of strange, and so the results weren't what uh, I thought they, I was told they were, but in any case, um, they tried to expel me from the society. I mean, that was kind of a formal procedure. Go to Washington, you know, get heard, and so forth and so on. But they failed, fortunately. Uh, I was told that the basis for that concern, that very deep concern, was the fact that I had betrayed my nutritional research community. And I had become probably a little bit too visible about speaking my mind on some things. 
Um, there were other things. This is, I'm, there, there's a whole string of stuff, and um, I'm telling that another, another, another occasion, but you know, an allegation I had uh, that uh, I had fraudulently taken money from my grant that was sent to 32 members around Washington, the head of the NIH, the head of the FDA, uh, Senator Kennedy and some others. Um, that, that was, didn't go any place, fortunately, but just a kind of reaction. I'm only telling you this not to complain, to be honest about it. In fact, I'm happy to have some of those experiences because it taught me something. It taught me what the system is really all about. Um, in any case, uh, then probably one of the most significant, at least I look back, I had been getting money from the National Institutes of Health quite successfully. We were fairly generously supported through all those years. And in and, and one occasion, so I've been on both sides of the table. I've been on the review committees looking at the, 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 uh, the applications of others and then being the recipient and being on policy too. So I know that system. I know the way the NIH system works. And when we apply for funding to do a research, we are required to define really rather well, if we can, what we want to study. We have to defend it. And it's a very competitive system. Well, in any case, to make a long story short, what happens, what the scientific committees determine is the highest priority to be funded, usually the top 16%, that's automatically funded by the administration. I wanted to extend at that point in time, our China study had already started, it's 1987, 88. At that time, I already had started the study in China, but the real part of the China study never got done. I was really interested in using that opportunity that we did to actually gather together 500,000 people uh, in China and to follow them forward by collecting blood samples and then being able to monitor the kind of changes that occur prior to the getting various and sundry diseases. We were awarded the money. We were awarded the money. It should have been automatic. Unfortunately, when I went to Washington, they invited me down to pick up the check. I got uh, the first of one institute put down a $700,000 check for me to take, take home, but there's a couple other institutes there too want to have something to say about this. This was before the China study had become known to the public, but they knew about it, of course. Um, and I was handed a letter that said that I was a fraud. And so as a result, that $7 million I was to get for building on the China study to become what it could have become was denied. I never, got, I never heard of anyone in my community actually having a grant application awarded on scientific grounds but then in turn denied by administration. So I want to get past that. I just wanted to say the seriousness, the significance of what really happens, unfortunately, in the scientific community and one of the reasons why the public does not get to know this kind of information.